Человек под дождем. Good afternoon. Good afternoon indeed. Welcome to Moscow. Is it uh, your first time here? You no, it's here not, before? but it's almost as if it is. The well, first time I was here, okay. suddenly Leonid Brezhnev was in power. Oh, really? Uh, under the Soviet Union. It was 1976. My God. So How was it? How, it was fantastic. It I loved it. <laughs> oh, it was a family holiday. I was about 16. And, but I remember every day of it. It was uh, spectacular. Uh, What's was, um, especially you worried about this journey? Well, look, for, for me, the Soviet Union then was a very large entity, and uh, we took an epic trip. We started in Odessa. Okay. Uh, we went to Odessa by boat, and then from there we took the train to Moscow, and it was like, you know, it's not like today you get into the airplane, you disembark, so you're here. It was like a kind of odyssey, getting into Moscow, so it was very impressive. So probably you're impressed by this building, with some people call, which some people call the Stalin's Acropolis, because it's Stalin's well, area. Well, it's, it's as if, I, you know, I, it, my last visit was yesterday, being in this building. This okay. is, uh, it's a splendid, splendid building, mm -hmm. and I hope that uh, it finds the use that it deserves. <laughs> when I was in Greece last summer, I noticed that many people who support uh, Syriza, they also are big fans of Vladimir Putin. Just one man told me, yes, like, finally we have uh, the strongest leader as you have, he told me. But um, according to your recent interviews, you are not in Putin's fan club. club. No, Is it not. so? And why? <laughs> well, firstly, I don't believe in strong leaders. Okay. I believe in strong democracies. The whole point about democracy is that uh, every citizen has exactly the same say. One person, one vote. And countries that need strong leadership are countries that are in trouble. So if our countries were in a healthy state of affairs, we wouldn't need this kind of feel that uh, there must be a strong man that pushes everything into, into order. This is a sign that there's something of the matter with our democracies. More generally speaking, the path of the, uh, this country, this magnificent country, uh, an essential part of uh, Western civilization as far as I'm concerned, has taken uh, for a very long time now, is a, is, is a path that uh, uh, leaves a lot of room for concern. Okay, so we're in trouble and Greece is in trouble, no? I think the world is in trouble. Uh, there's no doubt about that and our troubles are interconnected. So we live in a highly interconnected world. For instance, the experiences that you're having, financial difficulty, are completely connected to the great financial collapse of 2008 in the United States, which is what occasioned the Greek crisis, in a sense. Uh, now you have a, a fall in the price of oil, which is undermining uh, Russian finances. Uh, and that's because of the, the China bubble is bursting, commodity prices coming down. The China bubble was built as an attempt by the Chinese authorities to respond to the crisis in 2008. So we're all in it together. Is that what Karl Marx predicted? Or it's something new, especially new for the whole world, and nobody knows what to do with these troubles? <laughs> well, Marx was the first theorist of globalization in the Communist Manifesto. He actually uh, is, is waxing lyrical about globalization. He's talking about how market prices are breaking down the, the walls, the Great Wall of China, mm -hmm. and uh, yes. destroys prejudices and allows for people to get closer together and to get rid of superstition. But at the same time, uh, capitalism is a, a very uh, contradictory system. At the same time, you produce a lot of wealth and a lot of poverty, poverty that has been unheard of. And uh, the, the, the crises that okay, are occasioned uh, are very difficult to contain. So we're still in the same world that Marx uh, described, uh, except we haven't worked out what to do about the absolute need to stabilize our economies and our societies in a way that we can have, we can share prosperity instead uh, of being in conflict with one another. Today, uh, if I'm mistake, correct me please, a new Greek parliament started to work, yeah? yes? And you choose not to stand on the election saying that you will focus uh, on creating a European network that would uh, restore democracy in Europe, mm -hmm. in Europe. What do you exactly mean? How are you going to do that? Well, 
the reason why I didn't stand is because this time around, like last January, there's no political party whose manifesto I can support. So the point is not to be in parliament. The point is to be in parliament in order to do something, <laughs> to do something okay. that one agrees with. Um, the one lesson I learned in the last year of my involvement in government, in negotiations at the European Union level, is that once you are inside this club that is Europe, national solutions are impossible. National parliaments are impotent. Whatever the Greek parliament decides now, it cannot be affected, it cannot be implemented because Greece is just like a small part of a bigger whole. And the trouble in Europe is that um, unlike uh, in a federation like Russia or the United States or Australia, where you, you may have given up the, on the sovereignty of small entities, but there is a sovereignty at a larger level, there is no such thing in Europe. So there is no government of Europe. Okay. So we have a common economy, a common currency and no government. This is a, a recipe for disaster. So we need European-wide solutions uh, so as to reinvigorate our national parliaments as well. So this is why I'm concentrating on European-wide solutions. Okay, and how, you just, how could you produce it as just like a private person, not in parliament, not mm -hmm. in government? I travel a lot in Europe, and the one message I get from almost everyone, people on the street, intellectuals, politicians, is that they also feel this need, the need to create a, a Europe-wide, a pan-European forum for exchanging ideas about what to do with Europe. So, as a private person, you can do nothing. But as a mass of people who get together and forge this, kind, this network, uh, everything is possible. That's the, whole be the beauty of politics, the, the, the power of the many. Many people in Europe and also here in Russia, they think that Vladimir Putin is on a crusade, kind of, cru of crusade, to undermine the European system of values and political no, systems. What do you think? I, as I said before, I'm not a fan of Vladimir Putin. But, but on the other hand, that. I think that the press that he has received in the West is, is pathetically wrong. Mm -hmm. So we need, um, we, we need to be realistic and sensible. So you do not consider dangerous? Uh, you just don't think it's serious? I personally don't think that um, Russia poses a danger for the world order. Mm -hmm. I think my criticism of Putin has to do with his effects on the Russian people and his tendency towards authoritarianism. So my concern is for the Russians, not for the rest of the world. I think Russia is not... Is, uh, uh, Russia had ne never really was. Um, an imperialist power uh, since the Tsar was gone. Um, and the need in the West to create a demon and demonize uh, whoever, you know, it used to be Saddam Hussein, then, got rid of him, then it was uh, Gaddafi who got rid of him. Uh, there's a great deal of uh, um, a vacuum ever since the Soviet Union went to the West, especially in the United States, to justify military spending, to justify a kind of uh, Cold War um, atmosphere. And it, 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 is a, it was a huge mistake on the part of the West to push Putin into this corner, because firstly, it doesn't augur well for, for us in the Mediterranean, in Europe, to have these conflicts happening with ISIS, with uh, Islamic fundamentalism in Libya, the um, uh, postmodern Middle Ages that is uh, threatening us. These are things that th these are threats that Russia, Europe, and the United States should be handling together, should be cooperating in this regard. And at the same time, I'm, I'm very much fear that uh, it's not, it doesn't go well for Russian Democrats to have unfair attacks on Putin, which give him legitimacy to increase the degree of authoritarianism in Russia. Okay, but I think about news um, that Russia entering the conflict in Syria. It's, it's well, look, the Middle East is a very difficult place to understand, <laughs> to manage, to find ways of civilizing. The reason why the Middle East is in such a mess is 100% due to colonialism. If you look at the way that the British, the French, and then after that the Americans carved out uh, 
countries out uh, of what was more or less a homogeneous lot after the Ottoman Empire and how they used uh, the strategy of divide and rule in order to maintain Western control all the way to the Gulf War and beyond. Uh, the invasion of Iraq by the United States was a catastrophe. A catastrophe for Iraq. It destabilized Iraq and that, that destabilization spread elsewhere. So you have a situation now where effectively there are no good people left in power anywhere. And there are no good people with power. And for us in the West or here in Russia to decide who you go with and who you leave behind is a major nightmare. I just believe that we should simply agree on that which we should not be doing. So for instance, I don't believe in bombing as a way out, whether it's the Americans bombing, the British home bombing or the Russians bombing. I don't believe that uh, the, the Fiji crisis is going to be helped if we bomb them out of, or, uh, out of the water or out of their houses. So it is about time there was cooperation in this part of the world to do something very simple, harm minimization to begin with. You once said that Angela Merkel has no vision. Putin has a vision, what do you think? Uh, I said that Angela Merkel doesn't have a vision for Europe and indeed she's the consummate politician in the sense that she knows what she needs to do in order to survive next month, next year, in two years time. In other sense, I think, Putin, I think Putin is very similar and very close to Angela Merkel. In, in, he's an extremely successful operator. He has uh, extended his reign far beyond what anybody had imagined. He manages to exploit the weaknesses of uh, his opponents brilliantly. Um, I think he's a model for any politician who wants to put his own survival or her own survival above it, every, everyone else. So I think that Putin and Merkel, maybe the, the reason why they communicate so well is because they're quite similar. <laughs> Going back to the time when you negotiated uh, with Angela Merkel also, could you imagine for a second that you are John uh, Chancellor? Uh, who have to negotiate with the Tsipras government, what would you do on her place? What I was saying to well, Wolfgang Schäuble, who was my counterpart, because you know how the okay. protocol is, ministers with ministers, prime ministers with prime ministers. Yeah. But what I said to him, and I said to many of my other colleagues in Europe, is that um, we were an opportunity for them. And they should have used us instead of abused us, instead of attack us. We were on the left, they were on the right, they didn't like us for that. We were saying things they didn't want to hear, but nevertheless, we had an advantage, actually two advantages. The first advantage we had was that we carried the Greek people with us. So if we agreed on something willingly, and there was a mutual, an honorable agreement between us and them, we would be able to implement it, because we had the people of Greece with, with us. The previous government didn't. Secondly, we were not corrupt. Uh, we, you know, we, we hadn't received a single euro from any of the oligarchs. And therefore, if we agreed with Germany, with Brussels, with Frankfurt, to implement the reforms that hit the vested interests, we would do it. The previous regimes wouldn't be able to do it. And said, we said to them, look, and we're also particularly flexible. As long as they, get, they propose to us or they accept from us, we find a compromise on a program that makes sense we would be able to go along with that, even if it wasn't exactly what we had promised our people. But it didn't happen. So, to, to answer your question, yes. if in their place I would have taken this offer. They chose to crush us as a show of strength that any government that says no to the program of the Troika gets crushed. I think this was very short-sighted to them, but I think that they will suffer in the long run as a result. It's people, I mean, great people. Uh, said yes to your party, to, to you, to your ideas, and you left the government anyway. But why actually? Why actually did you leave the government? Oh, because I, as I had promised the people who voted for me that uh, I would never sign an agreement which I didn't believe in on their behalf. And what do I mean by not believing? Since 2010, finance ministers and prime ministers after the crisis began, would always agree to do things they knew could not be done. Mm -hmm. And the cost of the failure to do that which they had agreed was terrible for Greece and for the rest of Europe. And we were elected on a platform, a very simple platform. We're not going to extend the crisis of the future pretending we solved it. 
And if somebody puts a gun at my head and says, sign it, I'll say, shoot. Even if this means leaving the government. So I was simply not prepared to break my promise. Why it's so difficult to make reform, I mean, to reform in the country, I mean, Greece? Because we have the same situation, but it's very hard to make some reforms. It's an excellent question. Look, the, when you have an oligarchy, it's very difficult. A powerful oligarchy, it's very difficult to go against it. It's doubly difficult to go against it if it is the troika of lenders that are in association with, it, with the oligarchy. The, 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 the oligarchy's greatest friends are the troika of lenders in Greece. Okay. The two of them helping each other. So when we were trying to negotiate with the troika, the local oligarchs, through their media, were attacking us mercilessly in support of the troika. They were the cheerleaders of the troika. And then the Troika is stopping us, or was stopping us, from introducing reforms that attacked, seriously attacked tax evasion, for instance. So when you have the Troika of the exterior with the Troika of the interior <laughs> um, creating an alliance against the, the public interest, life is hard. At the beginning of this year, you declared that Greece will never ask money from Russia. But why not? <laughs> First question. Two reasons. Firstly, because uh, Russia is not rich enough to plug the big black holes that we created in Greece as a result of a very bad monetary union. Let me give you an example. Okay. Uh, how did they defeat us? By closing down the banks. The banks have 120, 130 billion euros worth of deposits in them. Russia could not provide us with that money. And in this country, is, Russia is going through a major economic crisis in its own right. And it wouldn't be right for the Russian citizens to support our banking system when we are one with a European monetary union. Yeah? Okay. So that's one reason. Uh, secondly, while this negotiation was going on with, um, uh, with Europe and the International Monetary Fund, Let's say that Vladimir Putin or his government were to give me, the finance minister, an advance, five billion, so let's say this number has been tabled, okay. uh, for one of the pipelines. It would go straight through down the drain. Why? Because the, we owed the IMF 19 billion, and we would have to put it in an account for the IMF to take it. This is money that can never be repaid to our creditors. So, Money from the Russian people or my Russian companies would come to the Greek people. The Greek people would never benefit from it. Okay. And it would all go down. So unless the Greek debt gets ma managed differently and restructured, there is no sense in us getting money from anyone, including Russia. Did they offer money, or probably to the parties, seriously? Uh, no, they, would, they offered no money, and we didn't ask for any money. Uh, there were discussions about trade uh, exchanges, as there should be, between friendly countries, and possible collaboration on the question of pipelines, and energy, and so on and so forth. But the fact of the matter is that until and unless we settled the intra-European family feud between us and Brussels and Frankfurt, it made no sense to have any, any such dealings. Many ethnic Greeks live in eastern Ukraine and suddenly they found themselves in the middle of the battlefield. Mm -hmm. And it's just like towns and villages where they live, they just uh, become a battlefield. Uh, which side should Greece take in this situation? The side How of peace. Yeah. The side of peace. But let me answer personally speaking. I disdain, I loathe, I hate borders. I think borders are a very silly idea. Uh, if you think back to the 19th century, 18th century, we didn't have them. I mean, countries had borders, but there, were no, there, were, there was no barbed wire. People didn't have passports. People would travel. Russians would come to Greece. Greeks would come to Russia. There were no passports. That was a much better arrangement. I, the idea that we're going to build a wall separating countries. And Sorry, there were passports, and for Russia that was very hard to go abroad in 18th and 19th century. That's true. There were no passports. You have to uh, take no. the. Uh, oh, because it was feudalism, but there were not national passports. Yeah, they, but they Russia should say yes to go abroad. A Russian. Oh, if you, That's a, true. <laughs> a moneyed Russian, because the question of having money and not being bonded. 
So the peasants, the peasants could not go anywhere. They couldn't come to Moscow. <laughs> but yeah. they were not national borders. Yeah. They were borders between social classes, primarily. But when Lord Byron came to Greece, he didn't have a passport. But the very yeah. last question is very so short. The, 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 yeah, the, yeah, just yeah, just okay. answer this to this yeah, question. Yeah. I don't think we should be putting up new borders. The collapse of the Soviet Union, the collapse of Yugoslavia, uh, the new border between the Czech Republic and Slovakia, all that is a move in the wrong direction as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. We should be getting closer together, not having more walls separating us. I got it. In this case, who do you go if somebody, probably Putin, invites you to go to Crimea to visit, like Silvia Berlusconi did? Who do you go? Uh, I would have to think about it. I have no problem going to Crimea. I would have a problem if Vladimir Putin invited me, because then I would have to wonder why he invited me. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice Thanks. to talk to you.